Welcome to the WAN Show, guys. We are in HD. Woo! 2013! I know, right? It's like we've caught up to the entire rest of the internet. <laughs> and uh, actually, yeah, I should be monitoring here. I don't... Oh, well, only one of them's plugged in because we have relocated the entire setup of all the gear and everything. And we're sorry we're a little bit late, but we did end up sort of having some technical difficulties. We only forgot one small adapter. Which, for anyone who's ever relocated a bunch of tech crap... One small adapter is not too bad. It's not bad, and unfortunately I have no tech gear at my house anymore. It's all at Linus Media Group headquarters, so we don't have anything. But what we do have is a fantastic show for you guys today. So if you've been sitting on the uh, Twitch channel, then you'll have probably seen this already in the video introduction that we upload to YouTube <clears throat> that I normally record... Locally. Locally, and then upload, but uh, at any rate... Do Windows. Live. Sorry? Do it live. Do it live. <laughs> <sighs> Windows 8 is no longer permitted on hardware bot. You can't benchmark competitively on Windows 8, so we're going to tell you more about that later. Uh, space glasses. Space glasses. They're crazy. You, they can simulate things that you touch in midair. Are they're... you the only one calling them space glasses? No, the link is to space glasses. Look, oh, that's their website. Com. I didn't even notice. I, like, I was looking at the company name, I was watching the videos about it, I was yeah, like, meta, where did he get space meta. glasses Yeah, no, from? they're space glasses. Although, what's funny about their company logo, and it, okay, okay, this, this is, okay, I'm, okay, no, let's get to our topics first, and okay, then we'll okay. talk about that later, but remind me. Maxwell yeah. is, go, is rumored to release in quarter one of 2014, which might make NVIDIA look a little bit scared at the whole Volcanic Islands thing coming out soon. Because remember guys, the way that AMD and NVIDIA control information, if there's a leak, they wanted there to be a leak, pretty much. They're so tight about that stuff. So if they're leaking, hey, we got stuff coming, it might be because they want to talk about how you should probably not quite run out and buy an AMD graphics card just yet, please. Uh, so that's, that could be very interesting. The graphics war is heating up again. It's exciting. Yep. Um, speaking of exciting things, if you are Microsoft, you are either excited or not excited. Steve Ballmer is retiring. He's giving an awful long lead time. So he's saying sometime in the next 12 months, he will be retiring. Um, but I mean, that's appropriate given yep. that they haven't picked a successor yet. And you know, it's uh, you, you got to respect the guy for being willing to stick it out as much as an entire year more yep. uh, before just sort of leaving them to fend for themselves. So we're going to have more on that soon. But before we do that, let's kick things up a notch with the intro. Which I will have to lean over here to do. <laughs> So guys, uh, last week was a bit of a fiasco with our whole Squarespace thing, but this week is not. Squarespace is the easy way to create a beautiful website. Just visit squarespace.com slash Linus and use the offer code Linus8 for 10% off new accounts. You're going to want to check this out and we actually have something really cool to show you guys later on that I have had Diesel the Intern working on throughout this week using Squarespace. So we have a bit of an updated Linus Media Group website which I think looks pretty good and uh, took a lot less time than yeah. the older WordPress based yeah. ones. So uh, guys, you're going to want to check that out. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hardware bot bans Windows 8 benchmarks due to RTC issue. So basically, if you decrease the base clock and increase your multiplier... We should start with some background because not everyone's going to know what a hardware bot is. Okay. Okay. So hardware bot, guys, is sort of the governing authority on competitive computer benchmarking. If you haven't heard of it before, go check it out, hardwarebot.com. And what they do is they catalog and give awards to the people who are really at the top of their game. It's kind of like the, um, the, uh, the fecal standards and measurements, whatever those guys are in that South Park episode yeah. with the giant turd. So they oversee all this stuff, uh, even if the, only the kinds of people who, you know, are really into computers, just like kinds of people who are really into turd size might actually care about it. They dedicate a, an unbelievable amount of effort into making sure that everything's fair and everything's on the up and up, which ain't easy with anything digital. 
because uh, all these overclocker guys. So easy to spoof things. They're, they're tuners and tweakers and geeks and hackers. And you got to be sort of fighting that while helping them to, anyway. Yeah. Okay, so that's hardware bot. So what's an RTC? Uh, the RTC is the clock in Windows. So it's, it's keeping track of time. And if that isn't properly running, things can get really, really messed up. So there's a lot of things that rely on RTC. Backups rely on RTC. Benchmarks, some benchmarks, not all benchmarks rely on RTC. Um, anything App scheduled. Applications anytime. can rely on RTC. Yep. So if you play, um, like if you ever played older Windows 3.1 games, like I had this one game called Goose, where you were like a little like tank and you're like, <laughs> and you, it was, anyway, it was good. I liked it. Um, what happened was my family upgraded our computer and all of a sudden the tank went so fast I couldn't do anything <laughs> because that application was not taking time from the system's RTC. It was actually just running as fast as the processor could possibly run it. And uh, okay. That's a thing. That's so a RTC thing. is good. Yeah. We like it. Okay, so the problem has to do with certain Intel platforms and Windows 8. So the base clock is how the clock speed of your CPU, which should not be confused with the system clock that's running, because that's what was happening in that old Goose thing, whereas the time for the application was derived from the clock speed of the CPU, which is t totally wrong now. It's crazy. It's insane. It should have never worked that way. No, but a lot of them did. So the clock speed of your CPU is derived from the multiplier times the base clock. So when you're increasing or decreasing the base clock, what are we seeing here? So what's happening is they're, they're allowing for a bigger time window by decreasing their base clock, but then not making their CPU faster by increasing their multiplier. Mm -hmm. So the CPU has, instead of say five minutes, it'll have five minutes and 18 seconds to complete the benchmark. And in that amount of time, a lot of benchmarks are like, okay, how much can you do in this amount of time? Yes. So they give themselves 18 more seconds, but they're at the same speed they were before. Right. So they decrease their base clock, increase their multiplier, give themselves a bigger window, and then achieve a better score. Now, to be clear, hardware bot doesn't necessarily um, think that this was being intentionally exploited. At least that's the official word. Yeah. Who yeah. knows what they know or don't know. Yeah. But they have found the error, and the... Here's a, I mean, here's a funny thing is you talk to even super knowledgeable people like, uh, you know, I was talking to um, Andre Yang and JJ from ASUS where my whole thing to them was, well, changing base clock doesn't really change performance. And they were like, well, it can in certain cases. So for all we know, base clock can change performance in certain cases. This is true. But for all we know, some of the perceived improvements in performance we were getting from base clock tuning might have been because we didn't have a second stopwatch running next to yep. this other system. And it's as much as a 7% difference. 7% difference if you, uh, like, you can get it higher. Or 6%. But yeah, 6%. You, you can, depending on how you adjust it and stuff, you can, you can adjust that difference a little bit. So depending how much you're underclocking the base clock and compensating with multiplier, you can move around how much of a difference it makes. So what you could do is if you were intentionally exploiting it, you could yeah. actually tune it so that you beat someone else by like half a percent so that it's believable. It looks reasonable. But yeah, very, very fascinating. And you know, you look at an issue like this and you get to kind of wonder, well, who's, I mean, whose problem is it to fix this exactly? Yeah. Yeah, like uh, apparently the changes were made so that Windows 8 could be put on much lower power devices. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to run the new RTC than it used to be. So m different processors and all that kind of stuff can do it much better. And the thing there is that how easy is it going to be for Microsoft to patch this when they still have to enable you know, whatever other devices, uh, whether it's, you know, um, super low power Intel Haswell based yeah. chips, or they're probably using the same technology in RT, so they're going to have to probably adapt it for ARM, or they're going to have to run two separate clocks. It just gets really awkward, right? I mean, the idea of RT in Windows 8 is that aside from x86 compatibility, they're supposed to be and then how much do you expect Microsoft to really invest in this too? That's, that's one thing that came up to my mind right away. It was like, okay, hey, it's a whole bunch of niche overclockers, which I love, but does Microsoft care that much? Like they've obviously been moving away from But gaming. we don't know what else this affects. I mean, for all we know, this could affect um, simulations of Definitely. oil pipeline drilling. Yeah. Or something like that. So if something like that comes in, they'll get, I think, more pressure than they will from the overclocking community. Yeah, definitely. The overclocking community is... Uh... You know, 
awesome but not that big. We we love them. Yeah. What can but what can we say? So um, our scheduled guest for today is Locker Gnome or Chris Perillo, as uh, depending on at what point in history you followed him or how closely you'll have probably heard of him. Though he's one of the pioneers of tech videos, to to put it to put it mildly. So I'm I'm just tweeting him right now and finding out where we're at on that because I don't think we managed to get a uh, a test call going today. So hopefully we're going to get that going pretty quick. Just wanted to bring that up. And our next. Topic, should we jump right into EA? Might as well. I, yeah, might as well. EA moment. We need like an intro thing for this so that we can like really do it properly. I mean, they, they the, didn't do anything bad this week. They didn't do anything bad. So, our source for this one is Escapist Magazine. And like, you know, they don't, they don't know what to make of it. We don't know what to make of it. EA offers full refunds for unsatisfied origin customers. Now, my first reaction to this was I was like, okay, it's escapist, so they're probably trolling EA because EA is offering refunds on origin, which is free <laughs> or something. Like, I mean, that's the level of stupidity we've come to expect from these guys. But no, that is not what they did. So it's supposed to be a benefit over like physical retail. So with physical retail, you buy a game, you try and return it, no. No, not, not so happen. much. Not a PC game because it has a license attached to but it. But I mean, a big part of that is because the, that digital license yep. is because is, I mean, you used to be able to return games back when they didn't have a serial number attached to it that was like, you know, a one time use Battle.net account that now all of a sudden the serial number means nothing. Yeah. Back before that, you could return them. So it's actually the, the digital rights that are making it so that retailers can't take games back. And from my perspective, I'm looking at a digital piece of merchandise going, well, hold on a minute. Why can't Steam give you a refund? I totally could because they can remove it from your account and that's the only way you have to use this thing. So if they remove it from your account, they can take the key back and resell that key. And I understand the, uh, you know, you don't want someone buying a game to do a speed run of it and returning it, but I think EA has found a very nice balance here. So they're calling it the Great Game Guarantee. It's only running on EA titles. Irony! <laughs> this is weird. No, I understand it. Because how would you get a third party developer to To take a game back? Well agree what I was this, thinking right? is is you could you could you buy batches of keys. I think this is how it works, I'm not entirely sure, but you buy batches because Steam will run out of keys for certain games sometimes. So I think they buy batches. I don't know, don't quote me on that. But you have this batch of keys. If you get returned, you just put that back into inventory and resell it. Uh, unless the license terms you have with the developer don't allow you to do that. That's true. Yeah. Which could very well be the that case. Could very well be true. So they're doing EA games only. Um, they are allowing either 24 hours after you first launch the game or seven days after you buy the title. So whichever they're giving you first. whichever comes first. Um, and they're giving you that long to just say, no, I actually don't like this game at all. I, you know, because this, I mean, it's not the kind of thing where it's like, oh, you know, I'm. 12 hours into the campaign and ah, maybe it's not the greatest thing ever. If you're 12 hours into the campaign, the idea is you buy it. This is to protect you from, oh, it's not compatible with my graphics card. Or like, you know, Crossfire stutters all over the balls and, you know, in or, Crisis or, 2. Or, you, or it's a bad sequel or something, you don't like it and you know right away. You know instantly, the idea is you're not stuck with it, you can get a full refund. I mean, if it was of like a launch day bug, you could even return it and go, you know what, I still want to play this game, but maybe, buy it later. maybe I'll buy it when they fix the bug. And I think this puts the right kind of pressure on the game developers too, to stop releasing, you know, day one or day two or day three patches. Because now the pressure is going to be on the EA teams to deliver a working title at launch, because otherwise they're going to take returns. This is going to, I mean, this is going to indirectly make EA potentially a better game company because they're not going to be able to just be like, oh, well, we'll just release it and then they're stuck with it. Hopefully it does that. Hopefully it does it, that. It has potential to do that. One thing that I will see it doing is, I'll lean up, like, I'm not a huge fan of Origin. Origin in itself is, I guess, okay. The main reason why I don't like it is because it's another freaking application that I have to run. Yeah, Origin plus Battle Log. Oh, Battle Log. Like, like, oh, Battle Log. Okay, sorry. I, I hate Battle Log. Don't give me, yeah. Um, but, like, this makes it look pretty enticing. 
Because Steam, you have no ability to do this. Steam has summer sales, you can buy things for $2, but Steam doesn't have any ability. And to officially, Origin has one selling point that Steam doesn't now. One, but it still has one. But that's one. That's one. And are we getting, I mean, are we getting closer to digital? I think this is crazy. Where digital retail is behind physical retail for customer satisfaction policies. Isn't that insane? Where Amazon has a better return policy than Steam. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I mean, Amazon has to, a lot of the times, you know, a, a lot of... I, for particularly items where there's some actual margin built into them, they'll even ship a return label for you to ship it back to them. Not only are they not getting your money for the transaction, they're going to eat shipping back on it, they're losing money on it. Yep. Whereas Steam, there is no shipping. No. They could even make it an automated system, apply for a refund within, even if they gave you six hours. You know, if they gave me, honestly, I'd be happy with that. I can usually figure out if I'm going to like a game in six hours. Yeah, six hours after first launch, I think, would even be fair. But EA has gone above and beyond that. They've said 24 hours. If you're not going to get more than a full day's enjoyment out of our game, then we're going to give it back. If you to wait you. till the weekend, play it on Saturday, and just go for gold, you can beat a lot of games in 24 hours. Well, I, I mean, I don't want to encourage people to do that. No, either. but That's I'm just not saying fair. It's, it's ballsy on EA's half on behalf to allow a 24-hour window because of that. I agree it's not fair, and if I like a game, I'm going to pay for it. But it's, it's pretty ballsy, and they're going to get a lot of people doing that. Not that I think it's right, but they're going to get a lot of people doing that. And that's frustrating. I wish it, I wish it didn't have to be like that. I mean, I, I am I, I, I'm like, I'm like gushing about how greedy EA is it's right weird. now. But, like, okay, at the same time, like, Steam's great. I love Steam. Compare them to Valve and Blizzard at this point, though. Yeah. I mean, look at Blizzard. Who could be more draconian than Blizzard about, no, you pay, you own. <laughs> I mean, look at how broken some of the stuff they've done over the last while is, and no, you pay, you own. That's it. So I, uh, I, I, I love this. Diablo 3 launch. Imagine how many returns they would have gotten for Diablo 3 launch. I know. It's crazy. So, like, the pressure is going to be on EA to, like, no, no, that sports game is, like, you know, going to have the right stats for, you know, whoever. Anyway, moving into Diablo 3. Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls expansion is coming. We don't know when. No. But, but it's it, coming. But it's coming. So this was an article uh, on Joystick. So I'm just going to go ahead and flip over there right now. I'm going to zoom in on that there for you guys. So it was revealed at Gamescom, and there's actually quite a lot of information given about it. The, let's start with the less important stuff, I guess. So sure. there's a new class um, that is going to be called the Crusader. So it's going to be kind of like a paladin, which it's like, who didn't see that one coming? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was kind of surprised it wasn't like... You know, ready. I, I thought they were going to have more class. Anyways. Well, yeah. they were saving it for yeah. expansions, I guess. Yeah. I mean... But, like, really? Yeah. I don't know. It had very few classes at launch. What yeah. was it for? Uh, warrior, Demon Hunter, Wizard. And Rogue, basically. Or whatever they call it now. I don't remember. Anyway, okay, so they had a few, so now it's like, yay, one more class. And so there's new endgame content, there's a higher level cap, uh, there's new monsters, there's a new story act, but this is what I want to talk about. The new loot system, Loot 2.0. Yeah. They've actually taken... I mean, look at this, I'm going to say something positive about Blizzard today, too. Positivity day. I know, <laughs> it's like, the good news show. <laughs> Uh, so, the new loot system is going to adapt the drops to be fewer, so your inventory isn't just going to be full of stupid, like, you know, leg of worts all the time. I don't even know if that's a thing anymore, but see, I'm showing my old schoolness. Oh, I forgot to change back to us. So, uh, yeah, not so full of, you know, stupid stuff anymore, but it's going to be uh, fewer, better drops. More tailored. More and. In addition to that, something to do with that you might actually want to use them. Because right up till now, it looked like, okay, you were just kind of farming gold. So, so you that, could buy things in the auction house. Which is just like, oh. Which is like, okay, yes, Blizzard, we know you get a cut out of the auction house sales, and that's great for you. But it shouldn't, you shouldn't just be buying all the gear. That takes the satisfaction out of a dungeon crawler. What's fun about grinding? 
unless there's like the thrill of getting the drop, which is much lower when you fully expect to just be farming gold to buy it out of an auction house. And how disappointing is it to get a drop that's like so legit and not anything to do with anything you can use? So now you get to go and like sell it. It's like it's like uh, it's like you know Diablo three accounting edition. Yeah. Instead of the actual excitement of crawling around and finding that thing. That's 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 so cool. I mean, if I just wanted to grind and buy something, I could go do odd jobs for people in their yards. I could get a tan. I could work on my muscles, and then I could go buy whatever sword I want. Because that's basically what it was. So I think it's really exciting that uh, there's that. Oh, oh, and the new mystic. So there's a new artisan that allows you to re-roll stats on regular items. Which is interesting. That's cool. It's very interesting. It's, it's like you buy something or you, you, you get something and it's like, oh, this is like really good, but it's like if, I, if only it would sort of... Something, slightly be different. Slightly be more different, then that would be, uh, then that would be even better. So, so that's, uh, you know, Blizzard doing something right. It's just a really weird combination. Um, do, 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 do. How's that coming? <laughs> uh, I'm talking, talking to Chris on Twitter. He's like, uh, yep, yeah, we got, oh, I don't have Windows readily available. So he's uh, throwing uh, he's throwing comms on his Surface Pro and uh, is definitely working on it now. So uh, uh, add Linus Tech to... Uh, uh, <laughs> so don't worry, don't worry. Locker Gnome will be joining us. It's just a matter of getting the uh, the technical the technical things sort of worked out here. So let's move into our next topic. You want to pick our next topic? We got Ben Affleck as Batman. <sighs> Come on. Although, as long as he doesn't do the like, I'm Ben Affleck, and I have throat cancer. Also, I'm a superhero. <laughs> like thing, I did. That annoyed me so much. Yeah. It actually made the movies, like, aside from that they were amazing, and Heath Ledger is basically like the best thing to ever happen to Batman or basically my childhood ever. Uh, well, I, can childhood? Be, I can be a man-child. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I mean, uh, that movie particular. I loved Dark Knight. Because, okay, Man, so one thing you just mentioned... You Heath should just Ledger. talk about how great Heath Ledger is for the next 10 minutes and just completely gloss over Ben Affleck. I actually, I saw this on Reddit. This is like one of the only times I've actually been able to get a newsworthy item from Reddit. Because uh, our forum is just too good at the moment. But uh, Heath Ledger, when he was casted as the Joker, got a whole bunch of flack. Because of previous movies that he had done. 10 and Things I Hate About You is an awesome movie. So whatever. <laughs> he, he didn't look like he would be able to fit the role very well because of a lot of the previous roles that he had done so he got a ton of flack now that being said I don't think he's gotten as much flack as Ben Affleck but so there's Ben Affleck I mean I understand that Bruce Wayne is supposed to be a pretty boy and he's got the he's got the chin dimple yeah he's, he's got the chin <laughs> so we give him full marks for a chin <laughs> I just that matters a lot on Batman I know but I don't see him as an unstoppable badass and that, and you're gonna put him next to Superman. So like, Batman's already the redheaded stepchild of, of that particular superhero team up. And uh, speaking of uh, speaking of superhero team ups and redheaded stepchilds and Batman versus Thanks. Superman, um, check this out. So this was a Vsauce video that I don't know if you guys have had a chance to check out, but I I quite enjoyed it. So there's an ad running here right now, but. Uh, hey, here. Sauce, I'm oh wait, I'm not monitoring at all, am I? I don't think it's working. I have, a plan for that. I have no idea what the audio level is like. But anyway, the point is, check it out, it's on Vsauce 3, and it's What If Superman Punched You? And this came up um, in no small part because of the upcoming Batman-Superman crossover, is like, how helpless is Batman? Let's go, Batman versus Superman. He loses. Because the stupid arguments have been like, oh well, Batman can afford kryptonite. He has like kryptonite bat star things that he can throw at him. How do you hit Superman with a star? Yeah, it's not gonna happen. Like he's super, and I mean honestly, that's one of the things that's bothered me about Superman a lot. He's is too like, Imba. How, how does he? How? Well, no, it's that. Well, he's too Imba, and then he's he's like defeated by his own. Just it's not even like defeated by his hubris or his tragic flaw or anything like that. It's like defeated by sheer utter stupidity. But yeah, that's the argument as to why Batman could possibly win, is that Batman's the opposite. He always wins by his intelligence and planning and cunning. 
You can be as cunning as you want, but if someone like punches so hard that they could like hit the earth on the opposite side of the world as you and the shock wave that hit you would like, you know, bust you up, then I mean he's got laser eyes. But what does if he, he never, have to get close? What if he never gets a chance? Why does Superman never get why does he ever get close to anything? He should just laser eye everything. I mean, he's Superman, so it's not like, oh, well, his laser eyes might hurt an innocent bystander. Well, then he should, like, laser eye the tire of the car so like, perfectly. Reflect it off. That, like, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, there should never... But Superman's an idiot. He so always gets in terrible, terrible situations. So Superman's a dumb jock. Yeah. And... And, and Batman is the very intelligent, cunning, planning person. So Superman just runs around dun, 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 and That's Batman actually Indiana Jones else. that you were going for there. You know what? Indiana Jones versus either of them. Go. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh man. Okay, we but see, Batman always sets up situations. If he set up a situation with all his blinging amounts of money and bought all the kryptonite ever, he might actually be able to win. But if you put them in a small closed room and had a fist fight, which is apparently <laughs> your description of it, then yeah, Superman's obviously going to win. Okay. Now if Batman is Ben Affleck, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> then we're maybe giving Batman too much credit is what you're trying to say. I, I like Ben Affleck, but I don't know if he fits this role. Now he can surprise me, like Heath Ledger, that would be awesome. Man, Heath Ledger's awesome. I, I wish Heath Ledger wasn't dead. Me too. It's not often that I kind of sit around going, I wish someone wasn't dead. But I, I wish Heath Ledger wasn't dead. <laughs> oh, man. I, 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 I have confidence in Ben Affleck. I think he can do something. I do like him, but I don't know. It's not exactly his style of role. Yeah. All right, you introduce our next topic. I got a thing going on here. All right. One second. So Oculus is looking to solve simulator sickness. Simulator sickness is not like motion sickness. Motion sickness is when um, there's all this motion but you can't visually perceive things moving. Simulator sickness is when you visually perceive things moving and there's not all this motion. So it has been giving people a lot of dizzy spells, a lot of headaches, people have thrown up, stuff like that. So they're trying to solve the problem. Um, they haven't yet but they are working on it and they do think that they can grow towards the goal of at least reducing it to an in incredible degree where it won't be that big of a problem because right now it is fairly common for people to get simulator sickness. Did you get it when we tried out the Omni and the Oculus? I did not, but you didn't eat, no one did, right? Uh, I, out of our group? I felt a little bit motion sick, but I don't know if, like it was, it was at the beginning and then it kind of went away. So uh, I don't think it... Another thing for us though is that that wasn't fair, we were moving. Oh, okay. Because I thought about this. We were, we were not sitting planted in a chair. We were moving around. And one thing that people have talked about is one of the things people have been doing with Oculus Rift is put out interesting experiments where they'll have people lay down and then have them like fall in the game. I see. And then see. they feel like they're falling and kind of freak out a little bit. Um, and that is going to be interesting because you're not moving at all, but you're falling. So your right. mind is going to freak out, especially fast movement. So if you whip around or if you're on a roller coaster and you go down and your body isn't moving, mm -hmm. your head is supposed to mess up. So, so we don't actually have the proper... What I was thinking about with this is that I would join the chat too and then you could monitor through there. Mm -hmm. uh, that works. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, so, okay. On the other hand, this could be great for guys like Virtuix. With the Omni, which is the, uh, for those of yep. you who don't, aren't familiar with the Virtuix Omni, it's the omnidirectional treadmill that is intended to allow you to move around and walk around and run around, sort of like running and gunning with Oculus Rift. Um, so if it ends up being that you kind of have to move to use Oculus, this is going to be great for the uh, physical condition of gamers everywhere. Yep. And uh, great for companies that want to make accessories for, for products like Oculus. So and, and not that Omni wasn't already legit, but this just makes it so much more legit. Because if, if you are someone who is afflicted by simulator sickness, you can get an Omni and solve that problem, hopefully. Very, very cool. Okay, let's do one more topic before we, uh, we break for our sponsor break for Squarespace. And then we're going to bring Chris Perillo in after the break. So uh, go for it. I've just got one more quick thing to do here. This is another fairly short one, so we'll try and keep it to that. I can. I don't remember exactly what it stands for. It's like... Uh, 
I'll try and find it. But um, ICANN has banned dotless domains. Google was trying to get HTTP colon slash slash search. No www.no.com. And it hasn't happened yet. There aren't any yet, but they have preemptively banned them. Um, this is apparently a really big deal. I personally don't really care that much because browsers have this really good ability to autocorrect things. So it's actually really not that big of a deal. If you just type in search, it'll find it anyways, and that's dotless. So I'm not too worried about the exact domain personally, um, but apparently a lot of people are. Google kind of seems to think it's a big deal, but I can, I can talks, so I can does. They are the internet corporation for assigned names and numbers. Which is kind That's of That's like hilarious. the driest thing I've ever heard I, in my life. I remembered that it was ridiculous, but I didn't remember exactly what it was. Assign names and numbers isn't that big of a deal, but Internet Corporation I find hilarious. Um, yeah. Okay, you know what? I've got uh, I've got Chris calling in right now, so we're gonna go ahead and move to that, and we'll do our sponsor break afterwards. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna add Slick to the conversation as well here. So here we go. Yep. And wherever he is, there we go. Add friend. And in theory, we should be able to monitor things. So here we go. Slick pickup. Hey, yo. Chris, can you hear us? I can hear you. Hey, hey, that's fantastic. So uh, say hello to the WAN show, I guess. And if you could do a brief introduction of yourself for those who have been living under a rock and have never heard of you, that would be fantastic as well. Hello world, I'm Chris Perillo, aka Locker Gnome on YouTube, although I guess formerly known as Locker Gnome on YouTube since they've recently switched me over to my real name. I am officially Chris Perillo, and if anything, I create videos on a daily basis revolving around geek culture, not just technology, but well beyond it. If uh, I did nothing but talk about technology, I don't think I would be married. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, that's a good thing, I think. I'm happily married. And uh, turning my wife into a geek, we just recently started watching Doctor Who. I, mm. I got her to watch Star Wars for the first time uh, a, a few weeks back, and we've documented the entire experience. So, yeah, for me, it's about living a geek lifestyle and, uh, you know, loving geek culture. And so the videos that I produce tend to revolve around that. I'm just going to start out by saying that I'm very impressed because... Um, I have managed to get my wife to watch Star Wars with me, but she fell asleep during each movie. So she's actually only seen about the first third of each movie from the original trilogy, meaning she's only probably seen one Star Wars movie, sort of. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I had explained over and over again that she would understand so much more about me and, of course, the jokes that I would make. Uh, if she watched the movies, and that was enough motivation to get her through it, and she enjoyed them a lot. Cool. That is uh, that is fantastic, and that's very cool. So for those of you guys who don't know how to follow Chris, he's available on Twitter, he's available on YouTube. I think he's probably one of the easiest guys in the world to get in touch with, because if you just Google his name, there's all kinds of great results. Speaking of which, Chris, on Twitter the other day, I saw a fantastic tweet of a picture of you on the front of a VHS cassette. Can you tell us a little <laughs> about that? Yeah, that was uh, during a brief run of hosting a, a television show that on a network that no longer exists. And uh, during a part of that stint, we, and this is of course back in the day when VHS was state of the art, we recorded a, in an afternoon's time how to, how to use your computer. And this is right before Windows XP had been released. And someone found this VHS tape at a garage sale and took a picture of it. I got a kick out of it. It's, it's kind of cute. I've got a, a couple of them left. I guess they're antiques. I mean, <laughs> I, I have VHS tapes, but no VCR in the house. Or maybe I do somewhere. I don't know. It, it, it could be. I mean, if you're, if you're anything like me, there's probably a VCR, but it would take you years to find it. So. Now, that's the thing about technology is it's fun and it's interesting, but it's outdated so quickly. And it's one of the reasons why... Like with my YouTube channel, I've evolved to addressing more of geek culture. So like Star Wars is not going out of style anytime soon, nor is Doctor Who or, or Lego bricks. In fact, Lego sets appreciate in value compared to technology, which usually loses value over time. So it's, 
it, it speaks very much to you know one of the reasons why I've taken the approach of of tapping into my inner geek and letting my geek flag fly in social media. And you know what's funny is I've not only is technology more relevant moving forward from a uh, from a dollar amount value perspective, but I've also observed that it's more relevant um, or sorry, technology becomes less relevant from a value perspective. But geek culture, it doesn't do that same thing. And what I've noticed is if you check out my YouTube channel, three of my four top videos ever in terms of views are unboxings and overviews of a remote control fire truck a remote control excavator and the parrot ar drone even though i'm a strictly computer channel so to speak <laughs> yeah it, you know i i had the same revelation uh, some of my better traffic videos had to do with uh, my lego sets my the lego death star lego atat uh yeah, star wars lego geekiness you know and i'm like okay uh i need to be more of myself <laughs> One of the things that surprised me the most, uh, I went down to Science World and they had a huge Lego exhibit and I started looking around and then I noticed that everyone else looking around was about as old as me, which was interesting. And like there were some kids there, but the adults were the most interested. And then yeah. you go down to the Lego store in Vancouver and it's a whole bunch of adults and a whole bunch of kids. So it's, it's one of those things that you can still enjoy when you're older too. Y'all got to come down for BrickCon. It happens in October in Seattle, and it is amazing. It is a, a Lego, a festival, really, but it's, it's done more for A-Falls or adult fans of Lego. And the, the structures that people make are just so fantastic, like a scale model to minifigures to, of the Hogwarts castle or a full tower or thing uh, from the Lord of the Rings, not the official set, but like an, a, a my own creation build. I mean, it's just, it is so incredible to see the creativity that comes out of, of people you know, when you, when you give them the right tools. And, and that's the beauty of technology today is, you know, we're evolving like with Arduinos and, uh, you know, really uh, Raspberry Pis, yeah. low cost, easy to use, uh, configurable, moldable. You know, you can make anything that your mind can handle, right? And you're not limited by the tool set in front of you. And I, I look at, I guess, I look at Lego bricks for as non-tech as they are, in much the same way as I do Arduinos and, and, and Raspberry Pis. They're building blocks. Right. You can make something, yeah. Where things are, it's, it's almost like we're coming full circle because in the early days of electronics and computing, everything was DIY, and then things got kind of too complicated and the tools didn't really catch up to the point where nothing, it felt like nothing was DIY for a while there. And then now we're getting back into it with highly programmable things like Arduino and with uh, some, I mean, some of the cool DIY type projects that I've seen turned into real products. Like I had, um, uh, it's called the O2 amplifier. And basically these are DIY headphone amps yeah. that are just built by like a dude who designed it and was like, oh, well, I see a bunch of problems with the commercially available products, so I'm going to fix it. Outstanding. I love uh, it. And then now we're getting into 3D printers and stuff. Just being able to make your own things and mess around with your own things. Is we awesome. could be, this could be the golden age of DIY because yep. even you when know, you were able to build your own electronics 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and it would be you know, similar to what you could buy off a shelf, now all of a sudden what's always been difficult is housings and tooling. Housings and, and tooling can be 3D printing, programming and all that kind of stuff, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, blah, 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 blah. You can build a thing out of Lesbo, uh, Lesbo, uh, Lego and 3D printing. <laughs> well, you look at the, the Microsoft <laughs> talking about uh, enabling 3D printing by default in future versions of Windows. I mean, that's pretty powerful stuff. But that's pretty forward thinking for them. Yeah, it, but the problem is, is that it's got to be a lot more consumer friendly, yeah. and it, it's just not there yet. I've seen a, a few really amazing Kickstarter projects that would work in theory, but the issue I have with a lot of Kickstarter projects that have to do with technology is that usually the teams that have great ideas suck on execution. I mean, <laughs> you look at you know potentially amazing things like the Ubuntu phone, which is may go somewhere, but didn't really make its mark in terms of community backing. Um, you know, there's, there's sometimes a disconnect between the value of technology and the consumer adoption of technology and whether or not they actually see the value in something. Absolutely. I mean, I know we haven't even managed to talk about any of our, uh, of our topics on the dock yet. Oh, but, my bad. Uh, I know you're a star. No, no, it's, it's as much us as you, and I'm about to derail us again. So as uh, much of a Star Wars geek as you are, Disney. 
You know, initially I had a, a knee jerk reaction and gagged, but uh, you know, I really <laughs> have appreciated the way they've handled uh, some superhero movies, yeah. um, and, and and certainly uh, appreciated the bringing on of J.J. Abrams. Uh, appreciated the work that he's done. Disney can market, they can franchise, and the they've come out and said they understand that fans want them to go back to the basics. Think about the fans at the center of this universe, not necessarily the technology that empowers movies and special effects. And so I, I think their heart is definitely in the right place. They realize it's their game to lose, and you really can't screw up much more than the prequels. Uh, although the more I watch the prequels, the happier I am with them. So I'm, I'm very, very... Um, I'm very positive that Disney will treat the Star Wars franchise better than I think Lucas could. Okay, but look at what happened. I mean, okay, I'm going to play devil's advocate because I don't necessarily disagree with you. But look at even something that's an original IP that they have, like Pirates of the Caribbean. First film, I, I have no idea how many times I've watched that movie. I've completely lost count. It got progressively so much worse because really? it seems like, oh, come on. Really, dude? Oh, come at You're not going to no, no, tell me movies three and four shouldn't have been one movie, are you? I, well, yeah, I guess. No, I enjoyed four. I mean, it was, it was different, but I, I didn't not enjoy it. I've enjoyed every single uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movie. I enjoyed I really them, have. but I didn't rewatch them the way that I rewatched one and the way that I've rewatched original trilogy Star Wars. Really? That's, I'm on the same level as him, actually. I did really enjoy them. They're really good movies, but the first one was epic, and the other ones were just very enjoyable. And for See, me, I it really found, felt... Go ahead, I go found ahead. the third one more epic than the first one, I guess, for Pirates of the Caribbean. I, I, I liked the scale of the third one. Like, it, the epicness was there. Yes, I'll give you that. But it felt like, to me, the problem was they, they broke their own rules for the sake of epicness. In the first movie... We exist in sort of a pretty normal world, except for this cursed ship. And then it seems like it just goes, so to speak, off the deep end in the movies that come later. And it's something that, you know, you look at the really great franchises like Harry Potter. Harry Potter, for the most part, never breaks its own rules that it established right at the beginning. It, it allows it to... Well, okay, so here, go ahead, but, go ahead. But, but they, they're, with Harry Potter, they were going from a script. They were going from an overall... Arc. And I yes. don't know if they expected to do the same thing with Pirates of the Caribbean until it was found to be a commercial success. Okay, so Star Wars, are we going to give them the benefit of the doubt and go, okay, if they're going to say yearly releases and big productions every two years, are they going to be working 20 years out on a story arc? I'm guessing that, well, maybe not story arc, but they, if, if they are faithful to at least adhering to the notion of not breaking canon, then I think they'll be fine. But the moment you step outside that boundary, like Star Wars was, okay, A New Hope was meant to be a standalone, right? In the middle of this 12-story monolith that Lucas had in his head. In fact, recently at, at a Star Wars celebration in Europe, uh, Mark Hamill had suggested that originally Lucas was going to have the Death Star around forever, but he blew it up in A New Hope uh, and then, of course, brought it back in Return of the Jedi. But originally, it was just supposed to be one, one uh, Death Star. He had ah. to make changes because he wasn't sure it was going to be successful. So, you know, I, I think he violated canon in, in and of itself by going back and establishing a prequel or trying to give you a backstory of Anakin Skywalker and who he was. But, I mean, I wouldn't have minded an origin story for Anakin Skywalker if, once again, they hadn't broken their own rules. The Force is... It surrounds us, it binds the galaxy together, it does all these things. It's mysterious. It's not midichlorian. Okay, Come right, on. right. Okay, so like I said, Luke, that's Lucas's problem. Luke he broke his own rules. Okay, but Lucas is not Disney. But and yeah, if exactly. Disney issues what Lucas wants, I think they'll succeed. But so should we be more <laughs> scared that he's a creative consultant or more comforted? Here, here's a movie to watch. The People vs. George Lucas. Watch it on Netflix if you're finished watching Battlestar Galactica and Doctor Who. Okay, I you know what I'm even gonna I'm even gonna put that in my document here. So the, the people, people versus, versus George, George Lucas. Lucas. Okay. Yeah. I haven't watched it, although I my do have a Netflix account. I got it with my Chromecast. So yes, my my dogs actually make a brief cameo at the beginning of the uh, the video. I dressed them up as Darth Vader and Princess Leia, but it was a, cool. a video that went viral a while ago. 
has That's nothing awesome. to do with technology. <laughs> That's what's popular. Again, again, nothing to do with technology. Again, nothing to do with technology. Okay, so did you have a chance to check out some of the uh, things in the doc that we labeled Locker Gnome? Uh, I saw the entire document and actually was, it was intrigued greatly. All right, so why don't we get into space glasses? I want to hear what you think of this. Um, the spaceglasses.com versus Google Glass, do they have a chance? Uh, do you mind if I actually play this video for the viewers so that they have a really good idea of what we're talking about here? You should. All right, let's play this video because if you guys haven't seen this, you are going to have your socks rocked right off right now. Boom. Oh yeah. I don't even know if the uh, viewers have audio right now, but I, I don't think it matters that much. Unreal. I mean, you got to be geeking out over that right there, hey, Chris? You know, it's interesting, but yeah, let me see the final product, because this is all pie in the sky to me. It's all shut up and take my money until you actually use it, and, and yeah. then it's a different story. You know, that's, I think, you know, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm going to pause this now. I'm going to switch back to, uh, let's, let's discuss what we've seen so far, because I think that's something that you and I are very much on the same page about, is that a lot of the viewers don't understand that it's actually not all fun and games doing what we do and playing with the latest technology. You know, I'd say a good three times out of four, it just doesn't work even. It, well, three times out of four? Yeah, that's probably give, That's probably being pretty generous. Say, yeah. That's very generous. I mean, it looks great, but dude, that's that's total marketing video. That's like, total, wow, amazing. Total uh -huh. marketing video. They're also huge. That was one of the first things I noticed is they're very, very large and really unsightly. So I don't actually see that many people wearing them, especially they showed the professional environment where he's shaking hands with all the different people and they were basically introducing themselves uh, verbally and through the images that the... Uh, what are they called? Space glasses we're putting up. But in a professional environment, do you really expect your boss to show up with this giant headgear? So let's talk about the culture of these wearable glasses um, first. And then let's jump into Meta's product versus, and I think their logo looks like meth. It looks like meth. It looks like meth, anyway. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about Meta versus Google Glass and how that's all going to shake down. So, so Chris, do you expect it to be acceptable to walk into a business meeting even in five years from now wearing a wearable glasses technology where other people are not necessarily wearing them? I mean, you know how stodgy people can be. Um, are they going to be feel uncomfortable because they feel like you're looking them up on Facebook while they're sitting there talking to you? And is that going to continue to be a stigma even five years from now? Well, you know, I've, I've been pretty public in terms of my you know, belief in, in uh, as far as technology goes, it's going to be in personal wearable technology like Google Glass. Technology is becoming increasingly pervasive, and I think it's a matter of time before a, a good head-up display or heads-up display is integrated within eyewear. The challenge I think you have, even even Google has. In fact, um, Russell Hawley, who writes for Geek.com, uh, recently attended the I think it was a Moto X event. It was a Google's own event, and he was told to remove Google Glass. So Google didn't even want Google Glass <laughs> at a Google event. And if Google can't handle that, I don't know how the hell they expect the average person to handle that. They it, have stated, the, sorry? No, go ahead. Uh, they have stated, though, in the past that they, they don't expect Google Glass to be able to be worn everywhere. Uh, people were wondering, like, uh, how hackable it would be and all this kind of well, stuff. Come on. I call bullshit. Come on. Whoa, 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 hang on. So let me get this straight. Google charges beta testers out the yin-yang to have this product and then says, well, we don't expect you're going to wear it anywhere, everywhere. Really? Well, That's the well, whole idea okay? to me. Where's not okay? And you know what? If Google, the only, okay, to me, the entire value of a wearable tech like Google Glass is that I do wear it everywhere and that it actually becomes part of my life. If my smartphone was my tablet, 
then I would use it occasionally, the same way I do with my tablet. The whole point of a smartphone to me is it's always in my pocket. I can rely on having it if I need to use it as a remote control for my TV right now because I always have it and it's always charged. It's like priority number one when I go to bed isn't even brush my teeth. It's plug in my smartphone and make sure it's charged for tomorrow. If I am not wearing Google Glass all the time or a similar product, then it's, it's lost the entire value to me. One thing I find that was interesting that Chris said was the, the charge for beta testers. That's hilarious. The, the, the <laughs> price of the product is going to be so much less than what they charge to beta testers. And, and here's the thing. Funny. I see someone wearing Google Glass. I say, okay, you have money and you kind of look pretentious. I mean, I have <laughs> I no know. Yeah. You know, it, ah. it's, it's, a, it's a social stigma right now because it, it, people are living on the bleeding edge and I, and I get it and it's kind of neat and I tried it. I, I'm very, I'm very happy to have tried it. I was invited to the Explorer program, but it was just a little cost prohibitive. I thought, well, really, am I, am I going to get my money out of this other than bragging rights for having Google Glass? Right and there. I just couldn't get past that. I couldn't figure out, well, how does this fit? And it, eventually costs will come down technology will become more usable uh, you know having it built into prescription lenses i wear yeah. glasses happily wear glasses i think it will become socially acceptable but the norms today are, dictate that permission is not implicit when you hold yes. a camera up to someone's face you, they get uncomfortable and even if know by law camera, you have the right to be filming them at that time they don't like it. And I don't see people's desire for privacy necessarily actually changing. In fact, the more it's been studied that the more connected people are, or the closer that you jam them in together, actually the more they tend to try to isolate themselves. Yep. In fact, it is less common to have a nosy neighbor in an apartment building than it is to have one in suburbia because people get so close to the point where they're actually trying to separate themselves from each other as opposed to trying to get closer and snoop. Yeah, I, I just think that people aren't ready for technology as much as much as technology may be ready for people. There are still social boundaries that uh, I would a great majority of the population are not ready to have violated. If if they take the camera out and like Chris said, are able to integrate it into prescription glasses that look like prescription glasses, that's where I'm sold. I don't want a camera in them at all because that's mm. just creepy and weird. I want no camera, I want them to look just like prescription glasses. But you just want yeah. augmented reality. Exactly. Yeah, you could probably sell me that. I mean, I've yes. said to you quite a few yes. times, it, I it, am in no way interested in the beta thousand dollar stupid thing. Yeah, no. But I am totally interested in Gen 5, yeah. Gen 10. And, and, and uh, personally, I, think I don't a, want a camera. AR is definitely going to work really well, but it's not the idea it's the execution and yep. Google has a chance, but they're, they're already sidestepping a lot of those mores and expecting society is going to keep up. And there's one thing that you cannot change with ease and that is culture. Yes. Yeah. So let's go to, actually, that's a great segue back to space glasses and let's segue. talk about. No, I don't have a segue. I, I never got a segue either. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny, man. Uh... <laughs> So let's um, let's go back to let's go back to Meta here. Um, you mentioned just now Google has a chance. Oops, sorry, Google has a chance to make it happen. Do these guys even have a chance? Because to me, the advantage of Google is nothing to do with the glasses themselves, or even to do with the Android operating system, or to do with a camera, or processors or anything like that. It's all about the ecosystem, which is something that quite frankly, is there anyone other than Google or Apple who could replicate the ecosystem that Google has? Yes, young D404 in your chat rooms. He, I think he can pull it off because he just said Chris Perillo is the best guest on the WAN show ever with three, <laughs> three purple hearts. Three purple <laughs> hearts he put in there, or she, I don't know. I've but got I just want to point that out. D404. I think he or she has the chance of pulling it off. Okay, how about spaceglasses.com? <laughs> this guy's going to keep derailing me. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to say I, I'm wa I watched the chat. I didn't mean to de derail you. No, I, I think you're right. And I think Google, if anything, Google's got a lot of data, and that's its biggest advantage over Apple. Google is a, a horizontal player versus Apple, who's a, a vertical player, which is why I have a big problem with anybody uh, who dares try to walk into the Android versus iOS argument because unfortunately that argument is 
it's outmoded. It doesn't, it can't exist because I'm, for better or for worse, there are two completely different market strategies to the marketplace, just like Windows uh, to OS 10 uh, to Linux. I mean, you could talk about operating systems and compare for feature for feature for feature, but that's but it's really asinine. person's end. So depends on who you are. Google has got the biggest advantage in terms of its ability to collect data uh, and, and use that data to their advantage. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, if you're not paying for a product, and sometimes if you are paying for the product, you're the product yourself. And that's what Google has. It's one of the reasons why Google created the inorganic social network, or I'm sorry, social layer, Google Plus, which I do happen to use on a regular basis. Um, it, it was looking to get more data. It, it, you know, yeah. Facebook wasn't giving them the data. Twitter wasn't giving them the data. And Apple has almost zero data that it's willing to give out. Yep. This yeah, I, true. I actually have nothing to really add to all of that because I agree 100%. And uh, it, honestly, it kind of irks me. I was a long time iOS user because for me, iOS was the answer. And honestly, I still use my iPhone 4 almost every day just as an MP3 player and to use a few apps and try some of the new stuff that's coming out so that I don't get completely to the point where I don't even know how it works anymore. Um, and they're so different and they're both so good that well, they're, they're different. They're different approaches to the same marketplace. Yep. And, and that's really yeah, and it's so difficult to talk about because for better or for worse, and hey, I'm a geek, I'm just a different kind of geek, I'm sure, but people treat technology and their choices for technology as if it was a religion. What? Yep, this like, is true. Your life really revolves around this piece of technology? Like, oh, hey. Let's talk about Intel versus AMD. Yeah, come oh. on. Really? Are we still, I mean, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Protestant versus Catholic. I mean, go. You know, Big Mac versus Whopper. Oh. Go. You're never oh. going to Okay, win. well, hold on a second. I have to defend the Whopper here because <laughs> at least one day of the week is holy it's... in the Whopper religion. Yes, Wednesday. When the Whopper gives back to you every Wednesday. <laughs> oh, by the way, Dat PC Gamer asked how old this kid was, and this kid is 40. <laughs> oh, oh, man. <laughs> And he loves both Big Macs and Whoppers, and you know what? That's okay. He loves both Android and iOS. He actually likes Windows Phone, too. AMD, you know what, you guys? I, I got to step in here, and I need to do a Twitter blitz for Chris. So we're going to hit one more topic, and I want you guys to hit us, at Linus Tech on Twitter. Go there right now. And, uh, oh, yeah, just a reminder, I forgot to mention this before. All of our call-in guests are powered by Razor Comms. Download it at the bit.ly link here. Please do. It helps us out a whole lot. Hit me on Twitter with your questions for Chris. We're going to have him blitz through some questions for you guys because, uh, as you said, he is definitely one of the more fantastic guests we've had. I don't want to, you know, diss any of our other guests, but Chris, I've you're awesome. One, one question I saw, I didn't catch who, who asked it, but Christianity versus i7. I'm gonna have to give this one. I'm gonna have to give this one to the Core i7. Honestly, uh, it, uh, done a lot for me. Sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't want to go into religious. Now that I've totally usurped the uh, show, I apologize. I, I bring you back to your regularly scheduled programming. You know what? No, I'm gonna. We're gonna keep the religious debate going oh, no. because if you well, can't it, see it, it does it exist? Oh no. LG it, has a it, new it, display. It's what it is. It's a religious debate. It's it's like no, it's Android all the way, and anybody who doesn't believe is gonna burn in hell. Like <laughs> really? Like are you serious? So wait, you're telling me that I have to live by your choices? Okay, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with living by your choices the moment you start paying my bills. That's right. Okay, so if you can't see it, does it exist? The LG display that they are showing off is a 2560 by 1440 5.5 inch smartphone screen. Although we'll probably kind of have to call it a phablet at that point. Um, Chris, how do you feel, as someone who wears glasses no less, about the race to higher resolutions? Is this just a dick measuring contest from the manufacturers? Is it just a fanboyism thing from the consumers that keep pushing for higher and higher resolutions? Go. Oh, hold on, Chris, you're breaking up. Give us a second. Let's just, uh... Uh, yeah, give me give me a second here. I'm just going to restart the voice chat on comms here. Okay. Okay. 
Sorry, give me a sec. Don't worry, guys. We'll be back to uh, your uh, our scheduled programming very, very, very great, shortly. Regularly, regularly scheduled entertainment. Yeah. Which I hope is very entertaining for you guys, because I am definitely having an absolute blast. With Anyone who joined late is week. like, what? Religious debate? What? I know, <laughs> what? right? What? What's happening? Okay, so hold on a second. There, there it goes. There it goes. Okay. We uh, almost have liftoff here, guys. So uh, Chris will be back in just a moment. As long as we're not, uh, as long as we're not dropping frames, we're still on, right? Like we're still live. Maybe we got hit by the the, the wrath of LG screens. We're still live. Okay, so it's not our connection this time, fortunately. For those of you who are tuning in late, we're streaming from my house again because we haven't had a chance to get um, to diagnose with Shaw yet, or have a new ISP come in and uh, get things going for us. So chat with uh, chat with friend. Uh, no, no, no. I'll add you. You're adding me. I oh, okay. Think I can do that. Because you're still in, right? Yeah. Okay. So go ahead and invite me. Maybe I can't do that. Oh, hold on. I'm still in. Okay. Boom. Yay. Yay. All so right, you're back. It, okay. first, first of all, let me address the person who accused me of being a Cylon in the chat. I am not a fracking toaster. Get that through your thick skull, okay? And if you disagree, you and me are going to have words. Uh, second of all, I think, you know, we increase screen resolution, uh, it, it's a law of diminishing returns, quite honestly. And, and anybody who can see the differences, uh, I, I would, they've got very, very finely attuned eyes because I can't. And unfortunately, they're pushi pushing these resolutions very high. And that's great. I love sharp images, sharp text, sharp screens. The problem is the video processor or just the CPU just can't keep up. And so you end up with a subpar experience. And to me, technology in a device in my hand or in front of my face, it's all about the experience. Forget the specs. 100%. Absolutely. Forget the specs. I'm, I'm someone who I, I know I'm an outlier, but I, I believe in specs to a certain degree. But without proper execution, what's the point? I've had great hardware and crappy software. And this, to me, is exactly why the guys like LG who are releasing this Oh, there's the problem. So I need to boost this one, yeah, right? Yeah, there, there we go. Good. All right, to me, the problem is guys like LG who were sort of, I mean, look, how much earlier was LG in phones than Apple or Google? If they got it, if they understood that it's not about the next five and a half inch 1080p screen and it's actually about the experience, there would have been no room for guys like Apple or Google to bust in Bam. And carve a niche in this market. If Samsung had understood, if Sony had understood, um, and and that to me is why Google is allowed to exist, and that is why Google and Motorola may be the one to look out for, as opposed to even Samsung in the long run on the yeah. Android platform. Uh, I, I wouldn't count Samsung out yet. Uh, okay, mean, with, uh, with Tizen or Tizen, how do you say it? Is it Tizen or Tizen? I have no idea. <laughs> well, you know what I'm talking about, though, right? Yes. Okay. This is the no open source platform being yeah. co-developed by both Samsung and uh, Intel, just to give context for those who, who may not be aware. I think Samsung has done more to help Android than Google, believe it or not. And with Samsung potentially dropping Hold on. Android, I, 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 I got to cut you off here. Do you mean in terms of market share and acceptance and marketing? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Then yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, because Google was seem to be content to let it be for nerds. Don't don't, don't get me wrong. I think they're spraying and praying. Uh, with Samsung producing as many devices as it does, it doesn't <laughs> surprise me that it has the the market share that it that it does command. Uh, you know, but they're they're going to be dropping Android, and and Android is just a means to an end for Samsung, and, and to a certain degree, Android is just a means to an end for Google. Uh, open is great when it's a marketing term, uh, but Google is you know not. I don't think they, they haven't been as open as they claim to be or have been. We discussed this last week, actually. In yeah. fact, uh, the whole fiasco with Microsoft and Google and the YouTube app is really uh, a window into some of the things that are changing at Google right now, we feel. And, uh, well, it's, it's true. And, and Google is, and I think Danny Sullivan put, put it best. He called Google Clopin, which is, a, yeah, I guess, a, an, a, an so they're horses. Clop, 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 well, okay, Yeah, you can say that. Uh, no more like the words closed, closed. and open put together. Yeah, I know oh. what he meant. This, guy, this guy's giving me this look right now. Well, how, did, how did you get to horses? I had horses as a kid. 
Oh my goodness. Okay, sorry. Keep going. Uh, is my volume okay, by the way? Let me tweak you. Yeah, I love there being tweaked. That's not exactly like a twerk, right? It sounds hot, right? <laughs> I wasn't sure. I'm, I'm still not hit with the kids' lingo these days. <laughs> All right. I turned you up. Yay. So, so, okay, I think basically we've come to the conclusion that, uh, okay, I agree with you 100%. The race to resolution in specs is not the be all and end all. I'm interested to see what Samsung and Intel come up with. However, the thing that I still am not necessarily convinced that they understand is the experience on the software side. Intel is not a software company and Samsung is not a software company and you look at their entire history of products I don't think either of them has produced anything worth a lick when it comes to software no yeah. offense I I know I completely agree I do not like the TouchWiz experience on Android devices at all uh, I think it's completely unoptimized Much let's talk about Intel Vive if we all want to be old about things for a bit here <laughs> Well, I didn't want to trip too far down memory lane. <laughs> oh, and speaking of, uh, someone just said, they, well, I don't know what it was exactly, but they keep bringing up the Nintendo 3DS XL. Um, it was released, uh, you know, just recently that uh, the Google Play Store and iOS App Store are cleaning the clock of mobile console gaming. I think it's just a matter of time before Nintendo has to give up and start licensing their titles to uh, uh, various platforms. Uh, I, I get a lot of flack. I get a lot of flack for this opinion. I think Nvidia Shield is potentially the future. You know, I, I don't disagree. I, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I bought the Ouya and was impressed with the idea of the Ouya. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think Nvidia captured exactly what needed to be captured. Now, whether or not uh, it's going to evolve that way, uh, I, I think I, I, I would I would be inclined to agree. I think Nvidia did a good job with the Shield, or as good as could be expected. Um, but it, it's it's got to be, uh, you know, something that users are going to think of and grab first. And I don't know if they're there yet. I really don't. And that's not to say that a console gamer is better than a PC gamer is better than a mobile gamer. They're all gamers. Period. The yeah. lion's share of the marketplace, however, are people like me, casual gamers. So plants Pick versus zombies phone. players. Well, no, I don't play. I honestly, the game, video game. I play Tetris. I freaking love Tetris. Uh, you know, I, I I play casual games. I pick pudding monsters. I pick them up, put it down, yeah. and that is most of the market. I mean, you have extreme gamers, and that's certainly a great part of the market. It's great entertainment, but you know, the, the, in terms of who's spending the money, a bigger piece of that pie is not being spent on any kind of console game. That's true. It's, and new models have developed to take advantage of hardcore. I mean, in the old model, you got to sell them the cartridge, and then that was it. Whereas yeah. in new models like free to play, you can continue to milk those hardcore guys, so at least it's not a total write off. But I think the hardcore guys really overestimate um, how important they are in the grand scheme of things when it comes to companies and balance sheets and profitability. You know, it's, it's really. It's interesting to be at this time uh, with technology and where it sits, specifically in the consumer marketplace. And even we're there with, with computers and, and tr traditional PCs. And I, I've caught flack for my opinion on, on PCs as well, saying you know, that they're, they're really kind of being marginalized. You know, the idea of a personal computer uh, in a PC in general is, is just going to an extreme part of the market, much like you could build your own car, but are you going to do it? Most people won't. And, and I've so, taken flack for that same thing, yeah, even but from it's him. For, yeah. you just, okay, if you don't believe me, go to Google Trends and search for the word computer and see how it's trending downward. People are not searching. Consumers, 99% of the marketplace are not searching for the word computer because their definition and need for a computer has changed. That eliminates the PC as a viable tool to be used and sold in the marketplace, which is why Microsoft is getting its clock clean. And I'm sorry, as much as I think it would help now that Steve Ballmer has announced his retirement from Microsoft, I don't think Microsoft's going to change its ways. If only because the CEO or even an interim CEO is going to be appointed by the board and be signed off on by Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, and the board. So. Microsoft's not going to bring in someone radically different. And unfortunately, this is it's a hard truth, 
but you have to accept that the world doesn't need Windows as much as Windows needs the world. And Microsoft's been yeah. operating from a completely different perspective, which is exactly why we have this monstrosity, this Frankenstein's monster that's known as Windows 8, or even worse, Windows RT. I, I, I agree with a lot. Well, hold on. I would make the argument that we don't really have Windows RT because no one owns a device that has it on it. <laughs> okay, you said it, not me. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with a lot of that, but not quite all of it. With the new consoles coming out, PC gaming is getting bigger. Now, PCs as a consumer device, I think, might kind of float away, but they might become more of a dedicated gaming machine. Exactly and like you said. And we don't like, need Windows for that. It's like building your own car, except building your own car if it was easy. Yeah. So it, it should still have more penetration than custom-built, handmade cars. But, you know, the, the, well, we might be looking at the end of the HP desktop oh, and yeah. Best Buy being well, relevant. No, I have no issue with it all. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, you know, Microsoft's, they're, they're hedging their bets. Uh, and I think they're taking the wrong, th th their heart's in the right place. But unfortunately, they're going to price themselves out of the market. Uh, the Xbox One, they position it in such a way that it's an entertainment console, which is great. The problem is, I think the PS4 could very easily take the Xbox 360's place in the, the family room, if only based yeah. on price. And just completely eat its lunch. Yeah, I, I really, honestly, because look at it. Uh, in, unless I'm mistaken, unless they've changed their tune like Microsoft has done in recent weeks with just about everything in relation to the Xbox One, uh, it won't be backwards compatible with older Xbox games. Uh, you know, certainly games available on disc. The problem with that is that gives the consumer who was an Xbox 360, you know, owner more ability to shift platforms. Yes, it and, does. And, and why would they yep. give themselves that open? And let Microsoft, honestly, they, they, they're potentially shooting themselves in the foot by pricing it $100 more, even if it's $100 greater. They, by pricing it so high in respect to their core audience of who's going to buy it, and that's going to be the 13-year-old the kid who's begging mommy and daddy to buy them yes. a, a game console. Let's and face that 13-year-old kid, if you were like me, um, actually, okay, you were probably looking at different consoles than I was, but I was asking for a Super Nintendo or a Genesis. I got whichever ones my parents bought. And if they're saying, I want a PS4 or an Xbox One, the parents are going to make the decision. Exactly. And if they're, they're going to base their decision on price, nothing else. Ain't going to be about enhancing the family room. Ain't going to be enhancing the TV or that, the, the media experience. Microsoft has the right idea. They have the wrong approach. Yep. And you know what? They really had an opportunity with Xbox to, uh, and it seems like they're kind of taking baby steps in the direction of unifying the Xbox experience and the Windows experience. But it should have been that way from day one. Yeah. Xbox One, well, okay, Xbox first gen <laughs> was a PC. Why were they not able to do something, okay, and I'm not saying this would have been easy, but why was it not possible for them to treat it more like a PC and not even be sitting around worrying about backwards compatibility at this point because they could just say, oh, well, you know, don't worry about your back library of Xbox uh, 360 games because they're all going to run on your PC. We're going to open up the license now so you don't need a console or, or whatever else they could have done to bring those two devices together and actually converge them to the point where what they're trying to do now is they're trying to make the Xbox One the media PC. Because Microsoft and Intel and you name it has been trying to do this since, I mean, Google's trying to do it, Apple's trying to do it, everyone's trying to b make a media PC essentially. Yeah, but, but people and, don't need it and not at that price. Exactly, you know, it, it, not at it, that it, price. That's the problem. People will it, take it, it at It's really, bucks. it's sad because I think the Xbox 3, I'm sorry, the Xbox One yeah, is right. a better media center console than a PS4. It's, it's not so much a gaming machine as an everything to everybody. And I would have expected Microsoft to learn its lesson to not do that again. I mean, Windows 8, they talk about no compromises. I think the whole thing is a compromise. Uh, and for, for whatever it's worth, by the way, I'm uh, you know in chat with you guys right now on my Surface PC. It's uh, it's the only way to, to, to run the utility, it, you know. And I'm I'm running right now in classic desktop mode, but it's uh, it's something where Microsoft's trying, but unfortunately they, they are not addressing the need at a price where the consumer is going to buy into it. Yeah. 
So you know what? I don't want to keep Chris for too long here, guys, and I promised we'd do a Twitter blitz. So we're gonna, oh, that's completely not the right thing. So let's go over to the actual Twitter feed here. So Chris, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with it. It's pretty self-explanatory. Twitter Blitz is I ask people to ask questions for you and you basically answer them as fast as possible and move on to the next one. Great, so, I'm sure a lot of the people who want me out of this chat would be very happy with me being quick. All right, favorite piece of technology you've ever owned, go. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry? The Tenorion is a musical instrument, the MIDI controller that Yamaha made. It's actually right. an app available for iOS, too. Oh. What brands of products do you use most every day and why? Or maybe even just pick like kind of a, a favorite product you use a lot right now. Uh, God, I go back and forth between my Nexus 4 and iPhone 5 today. All right, fair enough. And totally agree with that approach. On Google Trends, the term computer has gone down while PC gaming has gone up. And this, I'm going to just interject here, this to me was a huge missed opportunity for Microsoft where they abandoned the PC as a gaming platform to focus on Xbox versus allowing them to be convergent. So go ahead, Chris, hit it. Yeah, I think it's great. I, I think uh, the, the, the idea of a PC type of uh, piece of hardware perfect for gaming, but it doesn't need to be on Windows. It could be uh, Linux. It could be yep. OS X. It could be anything. And that shows with Steam moving towards Ubuntu. Uh, okay, here's just a comment that, uh, sort of a comment on the, the dynamic we've got here, which is great news because I actually already pinged Chris about this and we're going to be down in Seattle for PAX Prime. Chris isn't attending the show, but what's cool about us being in the same city at the same time for more than like three hours this time, which we were a little while ago, but we didn't have time to meet up, I am uh, going to shoehorn myself into a Perillo vlog at some point somehow. So we are going to hang out while I'm down there. Now we can't back out. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, by the way, someone in chat said type three for boobies. I, I've, been, I've been pressing three, but nothing's happening. <laughs> uh, tell me what you're excited about. Uh, boobies. <laughs> I, was told that, I was told by the chat room there would be boobies if I pressed three, and I'm so disappointed. Um, <laughs> you know, no, sorry. Uh, to be serious for a minute, no, I am married and my wife is hotter than any other woman on the planet. You know, um, it's amazing what makeup can do because like there was a there was a porn actress that was at a hockey game not that long ago and the camera was panning past and caught like the breasts, right? And you could tell the cameraman was like, what? And, and her face, oh man, when she's just like out and about and not made up and you know, on the set, wow, that you could sort of, you could grate cheese with it. <laughs> you know, in terms of what I'm excited about, you know, I, I just, I, I, I can't wait for the next Star Wars movies. I can't wait uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, you know, just, just experience, just live in, live in the now and enjoy life every single day. There's very little that I could say that what I'm looking forward to more than anything else. Um, I don't know. I just, uh, I enjoy a lot. This question is, is 5-inch or 4.7-inch 1080p smartphone form factor a limit? Now, I'm not sure exactly what this viewer means, but what I'll do is I'll interpret that the way that I want to, is for you, how do you feel about phablet? And are we moving in sort of a stupid direction where it comes to smartphones, just other than Apple, where it comes to these Android smartphone makers, which again comes back to that bigger must be better because we don't understand the experience thing. <laughs> do they need to be any bigger? No, uh, I, I think they're, they're nice, but they just, it, they don't, some people love them, some people don't. I think they're interesting. Um, <laughs> I think they're interesting. But, that, that, my friend, is uh, a term that means I don't want to say what I'm actually thinking right now. <laughs> it, yeah, it's interesting. I'll, I'll leave it there. It's interesting. <laughs> All right. We've never been into it very much. Yeah, not really. Uh, do you consider the Moto X a better Android phone than the Nexus 4 based on what you've seen so far? Uh, I wouldn't go that far. I think in terms of consumer adoption, it has a possibility, although I guess uh, Motorola had to pull back on a lot of customization options because they were having quality control issues with the engraving the other day. Um, oh, I, I, I think it's a step in the right direction, making it more consumer friendly, but I got to tell you, my Nexus 4 is still my go-to Android device. All right, I think, uh, let's see if we've got a couple more here that and I'm by the way, a lot of duplicates. Ask, 
asking me about my size preference is a very personal question. <laughs> At least we didn't ask you about your size outright. I appreciate that, even though I do have a 31-inch Darth Vader in my office. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what, Chris? I don't want to keep you forever, and uh, we've already given the teaser that uh, I have, I've invited myself to your show at some point in the near future. So, guys, <laughs> if you enjoyed Chris, let him know by making sure you subscribe, youtube.com slash LockerGnome. Uh, make sure you let him know by following him on Twitter. Make sure that you let him know by letting him know, and make sure you let us know how much you enjoyed Chris so that hopefully we can uh, grovel hands and knees to maybe bring him back at some point because this was a total blast, man. Yeah, Thank you very yeah, much. Here's the thing. I've probably lost subscribers now by, by doing <laughs> I'm Not to say that you, you, trust me, you have far more power than I ever could, uh, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if I offended anybody. And if I did not offend you as a listener, if you hate me, let me just say... <laughs> I just want to talk to your haters of me right now, if I can. Uh, I just want to say one thing, you haters. I'm on this show, and you're not. Okay, that's, that's right. That's really all I wanted to say. Yeah, we were actually, you know what is funny? Is I PM'd you on YouTube years ago when I was tiny, and you were like a huge deal to me, to be perfectly honest. And I never got a reply from you. And so I half expected when I messaged you this time that I wasn't even going to get a reply because you're still a big deal to me, man. You were a huge pioneer Aww. and you were one of the guys that I was following. You and Tiger Direct TV were the ones where I was looking at you from more of, a, of an edutainment perspective. And I was looking at them from a what a retailer can do to build a YouTube channel perspective when I started NCIX Tech Tips four years ago. You so know, here, for those who are going to hate on you on this show, they're not allowed to do that, you guys. It's not so, permitted. It, it's okay, but I just wanted to let you know, I ignore every YouTube message. That's the worst way to get a hold of me. I, I did didn't know not, better at the time. <laughs> I did not ignore you on purpose. I just want to throw that out there. YouTube is the worst because it's, it's impossible to manage. Yeah. I, I don't really reply to them either. I, I, I understand now, but at the time I didn't get it because I was still replying to every message because I got like one every week. Right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. I, we'll talk to you soon and uh, we'll see you when we're down in Seattle. This has been a total blast. Absolutely. Happy to do it. All right. Take care. See you later. Yeah. All right. Let's just. Uh, well, there you guys have it. That was Chris Perillo, or Locker Gnome, as the, for, the artist formerly known as Locker Gnome. Let's go, let's go with that. And I really hope that, uh, that you guys enjoyed having him on as a guest. Based on how many people are tuned into the stream right now, I think you guys enjoyed us having him as a guest. So I will make sure, this is my personal commitment to you now, we are going to try to bring back Chris. <laughs> At I, least. I guarantee you personal commitment, we will try. <laughs> I get, shut up, man. You're killing me here. Let's get back down to business. So I was trying to load this page before, and it wasn't working. There we go. Posted by John Lamb on the forum. Uh, Steve Ballmer about to retire. He wrote a letter that talked about sort of all the you know, great things that have happened at Microsoft, how they went from, I think he said, seven and a half million dollar company to a 77 Billion dollar, billion dollar company, company whatever. somewhere around some ridiculous metric that thousand x growth in the time that he's been with the company. I, I did the math. I can't. Seven point five mil to seventy eight billion, which is just unbelievable. He says senior management is still committed to devices and services as a strategy. So for better or for worse, they're still going down that path. And um, you know what? Let's just move on to the next one. This is an interesting talk, also related to. I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you I, cover this I'm, one. Here we I have go. Not been able to check it out. Okay, so this is our article, posted by Snow Comet on the Linus Tech Tips forum. It's uh, the original article is from VR Zone, and AMD says PS4 performance advantage over Xbox One may be greater than many expect due to Huma, which is their homogeni or homogeneous unified something archi microarchitecture or something like that. Basically, it allows the GPU and the CPU to grab references that are in RAM on, at the exact same time. So before, they could both grab it off the same chip, but it would have to be two separate instances of the same information. Now the graphics card and CPU can both grab it, which is a huge benefit. Part of the problem though is if it's not a console exclusive title, they're going to be developing it not with that feature in mind. 
So we're not going to see a huge benefit from, from this. Unless we do because of APUs on the desktop. Unless we do because of that and we will maybe later okay, on. Okay, okay, okay. Well, later on. They're not expecting launch titles to be able to get that much advantage from this. But it's, a, it's more of a long-term look at this awesome thing that if utilized properly could give a lot more performance. So it's a hardware feature now, but I mean, I expect a next generation or even two generations from now APU from AMD to potentially take advantage of this, which would mean we could be looking at a situation where the game gets released for console and then gets, I mean, okay, it gets released for PS4 and Xbox One, let's say, so it is able to run with Huma or Huma or whatever you want to call it, or is able to run without. It gets ported to PC, where if you have an APU, all of a sudden you can take advantage of that code path that already yep. exists. Yep. So that's what we could be looking at. Every, everything coming out, all the information coming out for consoles right now is just every single time it's like, oh wait, this is information for consoles, but this is so good for PC. So good for PC. Like, ah. Probably even better than it is for consoles. Like this is such a big deal. So awesome. yeah. We are, Color Us, pretty excited about, uh, about that particular development right there. So big thanks to everyone who posts news on the Linus Tech Tips forum. We appreciate you guys, and we're going to actually burn through a few of these news topics here because the camera's running on battery today, and I actually have no idea how much battery life we have left. So, uh, yeah. Wacom has a new tablet like actual tablet like not it, like a drawing tablet yes well, it, can, it can be both if you plug it into a pc or a mac it becomes a drawing tablet if you run it solo it's either depending on which one you buy an android tablet or a windows based tablet and they're saying that for professional use you can plug it into a computer but then while you're on the road or while you're doing whatever you can still get design work done uh, using apps instead of or Android use or Facebook or, use or Facebook. yeah or whatever you want it's an android tablet or windows tablet they're not cheap no. They have a demo demo video that you can check out in the thread. This was posted by Pixie Payne on the uh, Linus Tech Tips forum. So uh, the Android version is sixteen hundred dollars for a thirty-two gig model, and the Windows version is twenty-five hundred dollars for a five hundred and twelve gig model. However, when we want to talk about convergent devices, uh, the, so the original uh, oh source was just uh, Wacom's website. So when we talk about convergent devices, how flexible is this thing? Because it's not much bigger than a regular tablet, but it's got a two thousand forty-eight. Uh, different, uh, oh yeah, sorry, I'll sign out of there. Uh, so it's got 2,048 different pressure settings, and it is not much thicker than a regular tablet, which is just unbelievable. Um, it's, it's awesome because, uh, like, and another thing is, I saw a whole bunch of people go, oh my god, the price is so high, and I would normally jump on that too, but it's a Wacom tablet. Yeah, it's still a Wacom tablet. The price is going to be crazy high. It's a Wacom tablet. It has that quality in it, and it yeah. can be used in that way. People are going to be spending around that much money, well, maybe not around that much money, but a lot of money on a walking tablet anyway, so if they could just spend a little bit more and get this increased functionality, that's awesome. I mean, so $2,500, let's say you bought the biggest iPad available, so 128 gig iPad, and you bought yourself a Wacom tablet, I mean, you're already spending a whack ton of money anyway. Maybe go for a Windows tablet that also has a Wacom tablet built into it. I don't know. I like that one because then you can get full desktop applications to use with it. Right? That's so cool. It's I mean, really expensive, but it's so cool. And the, the, the storage space on that is insane. To me, the Android device doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I had this conversation with Diesel, and he basically said the same thing. It's like he paid the extra $900 to have yeah. a Windows tablet. Even not from a creative person. I'm not a artistically creative person at all. You know that. Neither of us are. Um, if yeah. I was in that position, I would probably fork it out for the Windows one because you just get so much more flexibility. And the, the storage space on it is so much bigger. Isn't it like, I think it's like 500 gigs versus 32 or something? 512 versus 32. Like, I mean, insane. That, uh, that, that's a really big deal to me. And we're back, we think. So we have a theory that we're testing right now to see if we are going to indeed stay back. But we, uh, we think that, uh, you know, baby got back or something like that. Baby. <laughs> it's a song about babies. Maybe you're not a parent, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> oh. There is probably a remix of that, isn't there? Oh, probably. Some, some actual baby one. That is so classic. Anyway, so without further ado, folks, let's uh, jump into our next topic here. I know this is sort of random that we're... Uh, that we're jumping back into things here. I know that's pretty unusual, and I have no idea how many people are even watching, but uh, you know, it's worth uh, worth a shot, giving things another go. 
We are live again. I'm going to tweet that out right now. So, AMD has just announced massive price drops on their new 9590 processor. So, this was the CPU with the 500 watt TDP, which, did I say 500 because I meant 220 watt TDP, sorry. But it was the CPU that now costs... Uh, Oh, well, see, this is what happens when my flow gets interrupted. They dropped it by $500. It has a 220 watt TDP, making it pretty much about as hot running as anything could possibly be. It consumes a ton of power, and the performance, while looking okay, was like, like, just ridiculous for $900. I mean, it's a... It's a lot more feasible now, but if you bought one already, I feel bad for you. And my kind of theory about this is what they're trying to do is make it so that people can spend their excess money on water cooling so they don't blow up the chip. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly what the, uh, the logic behind actually asking that much for the product in the first place was. And I don't know what the logic behind slashing it by that much is unless they were literally selling none of them. Like, zero. So maybe there weren't even... Because honestly, okay, working at NCIX, if there was like... Um, if there was like an issue, like, okay, like we've got like 500 of these and we're selling like 10 a week and it's at this price, we, we might look at it and go, okay, well, how many have we sold? Have we sold like two? Can we just like reach out to those two guys and like deal with them? And then you know, not worry about all the people who are going to be upset when we drop the price by a hundred dollars or something yeah. like in this case, in that case, it's only on products where there's like a ton of margin. Like it was like a weird closeout deal or something like that, where you just, you're experimenting with the pricing, trying to find what the market will bear. Maybe what AMD did was they tried to find out if the market will bear this, discovered that they've sold none of them. And then they were like, okay, well, we're not going to be upsetting anyone if we drop the price now. That was another thing I was thinking is, yes, it's a huge price drop. And yes, my first reaction was, holy crap, if I bought one of those, I'd be pissed. Then my second reaction was, did anyone buy any of those? Is, it, is there going to be anyone to be pissed? I have no idea. I mean, I know NCIX opened one to build a demo system. <laughs> Other than that, have they sold any? So, like, retailers and system integrators. Yeah. It's like it. And then, like, crazy benchmarkers that are getting them for free. Yeah, I don't know. I had a great question uh, the other day on Twitter. Someone was asking, if they release the 9590, does that mean FX8350s, which are basically the same chip but binned not quite as well, does that mean that some of the best overclocking FX8350s are essentially not going to exist anymore? And the answer is yes. They're skimming it, yeah. Yeah, because if they're skim the only way to get what you know is for sure going to be the best overclocking chips is to buy the highest binned part, typically. Now, there are other factors, such as what Intel or AMD or NVIDIA or whoever else are selecting for. If they're selecting for power consumption versus if they're selecting for um, heat output or, or whatever those factors are, um, that can affect it too. But in general, going for the highest end one gives you the best chance of overclocking. This has always been the case. But even then, we might be talking about differences of a couple hundred megahertz. Or we might be talking about differences where they run at the same speed, but this one, the lower end one, outputs a lot more heat or something along those lines. So, um, someone says uh, on Twitch chat, uh, Linus, I love how I search for FX9000 series chip, and you're like, the first two results. <laughs> Sweet. Great work. And I don't think we ever even made a video about it, which is sort of the most ridiculous thing there. All right, so let's, uh, you know what? Be uh, because we had some issues with the stream before, I'm going to do my uh, Squarespace thing right now. So if you guys... Are actually, oh, I hope I have it. Yeah, there it is. So if you haven't seen it already, then that's, uh, that's great. If you have seen it already, then that's great too. So we've actually redone, and I'm just going to head over to linusmediagroup.com, or linusmediagroup.squarespace.com. We have redone the Linus Media Group website with Squarespace. So we have, uh, partnered up with them as an official sponsor of the WAN show now, so you can head over to squarespace.com and if you use code LINUS8, you can get 10% off your first purchase. Basically what Squarespace is, is it is an all-in-one solution for designing your website, publishing your website. They'll take care of all the things like, uh, if you buy a full year, you get a free domain with your purchase, so they'll take care of making sure that your domain's pointed in the right place. They have e-commerce built in. It's great for things like portfolios. Um, 
probably the, the the only reason that we can't use it for everything is because they don't have integrated like for they don't it's not a forum so linustechtips.com won't be switching over to squarespace but linusmediagroup.com is so i want to give you guys a chance to check this out and here we go so it's linusmediagroup.squarespace.com and a lot of this right now is just placeholders so over here on the right next to the picture you can see there's just a little like blurb of text but we can make it so that as people cycle through these um, there's like some useful information about the different things that Linus Media Group does it's touch capable without any sort of difficulty so you can see I can move that around with my finger or I can use a mouse doesn't really matter or you can actually press the buttons it also scales down to different sizes so if you want to access it on your phone or tablet or whatever else they have over 20 themes that are all highly scalable and their plans are also scalable as well so if you end up with a lot more traffic on your site than you were initially expecting then it can scale up and give you more bandwidth as needed so over here is the end of our portfolio it shows all the partners we've worked with in the past which of course now includes Squarespace so there they are right there all right so you can also check out some information about our team we have four people at Linus Media Group so you can learn about those guys if you happen to be interested in that you can get in touch with us although uh, for the most part that info at linusmediagroup.com email is strictly like business related stuff anything else will not get replied to or even looked at because I'm not even the one who monitors it uh, different ways to watch. You probably already know about the WAN show. So there you have it, guys. Speaking of the WAN show, Squarespace is now a proud sponsor of the WAN show. And um, Diesel actually spent probably about six hours on this website compared to the old Linus Media Group website, which was a... Uh, shoot, what were we using? Someone already found a typo. Yeah, I'm sure there is. It's in progress, you guys. <laughs> Diesel did the whole thing in like six hours. Um, but what were we using before? WordPress. WordPress, yeah. WordPress with a custom theme. It was way more work to set up. It's um, very customizable, which is cool about WordPress. You're not locked into a particular theme, but they also, it's not as turnkey. So it uh, didn't look as good. We spent a lot more time on it. Kind of wasted the time because we never really sent never anyone to that it. website or finished it. Finished. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem with these projects is when you don't finish them, then they are not finished. We were trying to make an artsy, good looking site. So not me. And then it's WordPress, so it's not you. diesel. Yeah. So <laughs> it was not a really good situation. Don't get me wrong, like custom coding, if you're going to do all of your HTML and all of your CSS and just custom build your entire website, you can make something better than you can make on Squarespace. But it takes so much time and it takes so much resources. If you want to do it faster and honestly better than what most people are going to be able to they do. They have an advanced anyways. mode now, so you can dink around with the HTML and CSS. I asked. It's beta or something. Uh, about that. Yeah, really? Yeah. Can, yes. you, can you edit everything? I have no idea. I if you can edit everything, that's actually potentially really cool. It's kind of neat. Anyway, so I one, way or, played it with it for one way or the other, guys, uh, we're going to turn into paying customers because I don't want to be endorsing something that we're not actually paying for as a service. So right now we're on a trial account. You can sign up for a trial with no credit card. But if you do decide to buy it, please do use offer code Linus8. And that concludes that. Let's move into our next topic here guys so again big big thanks to squarespace for sponsoring the WAN show we really appreciate it um, speaking of things that you can pay for monthly should you so desire it dun, dun, dun. the elder scrolls online is asking for a monthly fee so just shut up for like 10 minutes so we can go to the next topic um no, no, I want, you to, I want you to cover this one. So that was submitted by Top War Gamer on the Linus Tech Tips forum. And uh, Slick, go for it. If, uh, if you want to reference back to a previous live stream that we've had... Um, sorry, if you want to reference back to a previous live stream that we've had uh, when... Wow, can't, why can't I remember his name? He, they have too many different names for all the different stuff. But Logan, I was thinking Tech Syndicate, and then I was thinking Raise the World. Yeah, and Logan. I was thinking, <laughs> uh, when Logan was on, we talked about free-to-play games. And the, the payment mode that most people are calling out Elder Scrolls should have been is a free-to-play game. Now, one thing Logan brought up that I believe both of us agreed with is yes. free-to-play games putting no barrier to entry brings in a not strong community. Every nine-year-old. Every single person that you don't want playing that game will be playing that game. And the communities in pay-to-play games have been higher. Now, 
is, in my opinion, a subscription model the best? Not necessarily. They could have done something like Guild Wars. They could have done something like something else. But the so angle, pay for the game and, the then, game and no then no monthly fee. Yeah. I mean, that to me isn't the bad one either. Yeah. But then, it, okay, okay. So but but the, where they're coming from is if they did any other model, so say they did the Guild Wars model, Guild Wars releases expansions fairly often. That's where they get their recurring income from. Now, you don't have to buy the expansions, but if you don't buy the expansions, you're not able to do everything. The Elder Scrolls team is saying, well, with this IP, you've always been able to do everything. It's a free roam, very do-whatever-you-want IP. Now... And the IP, will... like, intellectual property, not, yes. like, internet protocol? Yeah, sorry. Um, now, where I'm coming from with that is there's always been expansions and stuff, but I guess from a single player's perspective, it's not like you're locked off compared to other players, because it's single player, so you're free to do everything that is currently in the game for you. So in a multiplayer situation, they're saying, you can't not do something that someone else can do. So you'll always be able to do everything if it's subscription-based. That was interesting, and I was sold. I was okay with it. Now, if you looked at my notes that I added on there, yes. they're also adding a cash shop. So that, that's where things start to get a little bit dicey to because me, because if you're going to charge everyone to play at all, then how can you have free-to-play stuff implemented as well, like paying? So, so I mean, what is this? Like, I think, so quote from uh, VG247.com is, <clears throat> it's probably safe to speculate that these will include a large range of largely cosmetic items then if they're not going to have a pay-to-win model. So horse armor, anyone? Yeah. Like, are they, well, I mean, would it get them a lot of publicity? If they like, if the first viable was item horse was horse armor, armor, that would be huge. One thing though is that the only thing they have confirmed is in the cash shop is a name change, which is no problem. But there's obviously going to be more stuff. We just don't know what it is. Our